that's kind of what I refer to as bid mewling, giving your bid to somebody else in order to run a qualifying time for you. There was a case, I think it was leading up to the 2015 Boston Marathon, one member of a running club ran qualifying times for three other members. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who thinks no cheese can beat Pilgrim's Choice Extra Mature Cheddar, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 82 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for being here with me today. I appreciate you so much. Last week, we heard from the one and only Dean Karnazes. And honestly, I wasn't sure what to expect of that interview. As you can imagine, he has done thousands of interviews. And I had a feeling he was just kind of going to be going through the motions, especially as that's what he talked about in his book about how fans just come up to him constantly. But he shocked me when, you know, I actually asked him some questions and he really had to think about the answers. And guys, I have to tell you afterwards, Dean told me it was one of the best interviews he had done as I was such a good uh, interviewer. And I hope you don't mind me tooting my own horn a little bit, but my mouth fell to the ground when he said that. I was so blown away. Anyway, that episode was fantastic. And even if you're not an ultra runner, which I'm definitely not, you will really enjoy that episode. So if you missed it, be sure to go check it out. And if you haven't already subscribed, then you can avoid missing future episodes. So find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast or Spotify, any of the usual places, anywhere that you listen. Now today I have one that honestly, it made me a little bit nervous going into it. Not that I was intimidated by my guests or I thought he would rip me to shreds on his website, but I could tell he was just a passionate guy doing his best to help the running world. However, I knew we would touch on some controversial stuff and generally I try and stay away from confrontation and controversy, except maybe at an airport where what I call airport Tina comes out and she can be pretty mean. So hopefully you never get to meet her. (laughs) I have Derek Murphy of Marathon Investigation today on the show. And I'm sure you've heard about his website for the cheaters he has outed in the past. And I'm sure he will be a good part of the reason a number of cheaters, you know, stop doing what they're doing, stop cheating in the future. And I hope that is the case. But you will see he's not just trying to be negative here. He is actually really trying to have a positive influence as well. Now, I had no reason to be nervous and I did ask some pretty tough questions in this interview. So without further ado, let's get to the interview with Derek Murphy. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am so thankful to Body Health and their support, not just of this podcast, but of me through their perfect amino products. They help me recover faster and feel better. You too can get 10% off at bodyhealth.com using code TINA10. You know, I genuinely care about the brands that I choose to share with you. That's why I turned down a big brand recently as I really dislike their product, so I backed out. But I'm so excited to introduce you to a new sponsor, Bomber Socks. It is just in time for marathon season and I'm always telling you that you need to practice with your outfit before the day. Well, now's the perfect time to get some new socks to wear on race day and I'll tell you about why I love them so much later in the show. Derek, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. I am really interested. This is going to be such a good interview. Looking forward to chatting to you. And thanks so much for uh, sharing some time with us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is going to be exciting. And to start, usually when I go to interview people, I know a lot about the person I'm interviewing. There's so much stuff on them online. There's, you know, all this information that I can basically kind of figure out their history from. But when it comes to you, there is very little about you. Even on your website itself, there's no about page from what I can see. And there's only, I think, maybe one or two news articles about what you do. So for those who are listening, you know, it doesn't have to just be about your website, which we're going to go on to talk about in a minute. But who is Derek Murphy? Well, yeah, I'm... um... I've been described as middle-aged in some articles that I am. Um, the middle-aged business analyst, I think, was the, was the one. So, yeah, so I'm a 47-year-old. I'm a financial analyst uh, besides doing the website. Uh, I have 
two kids. I have a nine-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. I uh, live here in Ohio, and I've done a lot of running in the past, not fast, um, but I've completed 11 marathons. I'm just starting back up uh, running again. I did the Flying Pig Marathon this past mm. May. Um, I'm doing the Air Force, either the half or the full, um, doing New York City this fall. and um, Wow, so quite a few in a row then. <laughs> yep, and I'm doing um, Backyard Ultra. Hopefully I'm on the wait list with uh, that's one of the Lazarus, Lazarus Links races, and I'm doing that. So, yes, yeah, so I got quite a bit coming up, so I'm getting back into the running side of things. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I suppose because, like I just said, there isn't really any much about you, no one ever would recognize you when you go to races, or have you had people who ask if you are who they think you are? Um, it's funny, I actually did get recognized in the corral at the Flying Pig. Uh, <laughs> that was shortly after I, there was an ESPN story on me on a um, – E60. So it was shortly after that. So I, yeah, yeah, I actually got recognized in the crowd. I was rather, rather shocked. Uh, I, I didn't think anybody was... would recognize. I don't know if that's good or bad. I always have to ask if you know somebody, you know, notice notices me that they, you know, yeah, why you're asking, you know, <laughs> just just in case if it's whatever side they're on. Celebrity feeling. So still kind of cool. So let's talk about Marathon Investigation, your website. So in your own words, for someone who doesn't know anything about this, you know, completely naive to the fact that there is even stuff going on that shouldn't be. What do you do with your website? The main goal of the website is to just uh, bring attention to cheating in races. Uh, Started out just marathons. I've kind of spread out to triathlons and ultras. Uh, But the, the main purpose is with marathons, again, is to identify people cheating, particularly those that cheat to maybe steal a podium spot or um, to get into the Boston Marathon uh, since you know, Boston is in high demand mm-hmm. and just running a qualifying time doesn't guarantee you entry. Whenever somebody seats in a qualifier in order to enter Boston, they're taking a spot away from somebody else. So that's kind of the main purpose is not to call out every single person you know who cuts the course in a race, but and when somebody's cheating repeatedly and, you know, can taking either spots away or prizes um, away from those that deserve it, that's the ones I kind of focus on. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, the, there's many things that come to mind when you talk about that. And one thing that does come to mind for me, you mentioned about podium finishes. Now, I'm sure there's some people listening who are thinking kind of the same thing as as I was. Um, you know, I just mentioned to you before we started interviewing that, uh, I had actually seen someone uh, definitely appear somewhere, somehow in front of me in a race recently. And uh, I couldn't, you know, obviously figure out where he came from. And it had turned out he had cut a corner somewhere intentionally or not. I'm not sure. Um, But like a podium race, uh, you know, how can someone get away with that? You know, you mentioned that and I know there are cases now, um, but for someone listening who had no idea this was going on, how could you possibly suddenly get a podium finish without someone noticing that you suddenly appeared in the front? Yeah. And and that's the thing. I think, you know, people do notice it, whether it's just, you know, an age group finish or an overall, again, I've seen it all. One of the cases that, you know, was that really kind of went viral that I wrote about was a runner who, you know, cut the course in the in the half marathon and took second place and stood up next to the people, you know, to the person she cheated, you know, out of the second place and got the award and all that. And you know, again, it was kind of that people would, you know, question, talk, you know, and hust and talk amongst themselves and report it. But, um, you know, then by the time they kind of figure it out, the person's gone. Um, so yeah, that takes a particular amount of, um, you know, it takes, it takes guts, not in a good way, to be able to stand next to people you cheated and claim their award um, and try to make excuses and explain it away. So, yeah, that, that's to me, that's worse than the, someone cheating for Boston um, and trying to bring this to light. Yeah, they may not really realize, hey, they're taking something from somebody yeah. else. Like, hey, I, you know, yeah, they're being very selfish and doing it for themselves, but I don't think it may not enter their heads all the time that they're taking something from someone else. But when you're standing up claiming an award, it's, you know, that's, to me, that's particularly egregious. Yeah. Well, and the other, the other thing that you, you know, you, you tried to focus on, you mentioned about Boston qualifiers and, and, uh, when I was reading up on you, a lot of it is, you know, finding people who may switch bips, 
Uh, you mentioned that there was two types of people that um, cheat, which is one of which you just mentioned, kind of cutting the course or not running the entire thing. And the right. second one being switching bibs, which for me as a former professional runner, I had no idea, hadn't even like entered my mind that people would do that. Because for me, obviously, if I switched bibs with someone, someone's going to notice very quickly. So um, right. that hadn't even registered to me that people could do that. But like, explain how that would happen or why that would happen. Yeah, and it's, when I first started this looking, I wasn't looking for that either. I was just looking for people cutting courses. I was looking for the splits and whatnot. Then I came across, I think there's one particular runner where, uh, and they had a history of times and, you know, four and a half, five and a half hour times, then all of a sudden like a 320 and a Boston qualifier. Well, how that person suddenly run that? And I looked at the results. I didn't see any course cutting. Then I looked at the photos, and that's not the same person who ran these other races. Um, so that's kind of oh, what I okay. refer to as bib muling. Um, so um, giving your bib to somebody else in order to run a qualifying time for you. Sometimes it's done intentionally. You know, with Malice, there was a case, I think it was leading up to the 2015 Boston Marathon. One member of a running club ran qualifying times for three other members. So he was active as a bib mule, you know, during that qualifying period for three different runners, and they all ran the race together. So that's where that's how we kind of put it together. They're all wearing their running club singlets at Boston. They're all together. They were all very high on my list that I reviewed. And so, you know, so in that case, it's definitely intentional. Other cases, it could be, you know, some a race doesn't allow transfers, so somebody sells their bib. And the person they sold it to happens to run a qualifying time. So it may be kind of a crime of opportunity. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of cases. Um, one recently, it was the last uh, New York City Marathon, where that very same thing happened, where an older female uh, sold the bib to a younger male, a younger male placed in the age group. And actually, it, it bumped uh, Catherine Switzer off of the... <laughs> got down a spot. I think it bumped her from second to third or third to fourth, oh. um, you know, until, until they fixed the results. So some of it, again, I think is kind of unintentional. Yes. They, you know, yes, they sold their bib. Um, there's reasons why you can't do that. And, but yeah, but then it resulted in an age group award for the person who, you know, who was carrying the bib. Uh -huh. Okay. So for me, just being someone who doesn't really understand a lot of, a lot of the things that go on, I have to admit, I'm very fortunate in that most races I've ever wanted to do, I could just get in myself. Um, what, you know, when it comes to switching bibs, is it that most races don't allow you to change the name? I mean, what is the reason? Do you know why that is, uh, that someone, you know, unintentionally maybe, uh, right. would do this, you know, what's the procedure there? Yeah, it's um. I'd say mo most races you know, don't have a a transfer policy, or at least or they have a window where you can't do it so close to the race. So if somebody gets injured, mm. you know, they have a bib that they paid for. They're either looking to you know recoup their money or just hey, I can't run. Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna give this bib you know to somebody who wants to you know be on the course that day. So yeah, um, yeah but it's it's mostly to do with you know a lack of transfer policies or maybe or deferral policies. Again, some races, if you get injured, you can, you know, you can defer your entry to the next year. Or uh, like in the case of New York City, you know, you can at least guarantee that you have a spot. You would have to pay again the following year, but you can at least, you know, guarantee that you have your spot okay. uh, for, for the following year if you bail. Okay. All right. Thank you for explaining. All right. And so how did this kind of begin? Was this, you were always interested growing up in, you know, keeping things fair and people, you know, doing the right thing. Was that something that interests you or, um, w when did this kind of come about that you wanted to, to set this up? Yeah, it was really just, uh, yeah, just something that interests me, you know, more, you know, from, you know, when I was younger with, you know, hearing about Rosie Ruiz and then, you know, when I was older hearing about some of the other kind of cheating stories that went a little bit viral on the message boards and whatnot. And I was just kind of fascinated on, you know, kind of the why and the how. Um, you know, and then some of these cases got beaten to the ground. So I just found myself thinking, well, you know, how many people really cheat? You know, we're hearing about, um, you know, about these, you know, three or four cases that, you know, they get publicity. And so I just like, I was able to very quickly on my own, you know, with no special technology or anything, you know, find runners and results who, you know, obviously, you know, didn't do the full course. So that, that's what kind of got me going. It's like, well, why, why am I able to find all these and why are these people still in results? Why aren't they being removed? So that just kind of started the ball rolling mm -hmm. yeah, as, far, as far as going to that. And part of it is, you know, 
I'm a numbers person. I'm a you know financial analyst. I you deal with spreadsheets and uh, you know how can I you know look at the data and determine runners cheating just by looking at the data. Um, so that was kind of a challenge to me, more so that initially than kind of the right versus wrong um, aspect. That only came later when I kind of asked, I said, okay, yeah, I've, I found all these people who are you know cheating at their local marathons, but. Is it, you know, are they just cheating themselves? Yeah, I always, that's one of the mm-hmm. things I always hear is yeah, they're just cheating themselves. So that's when I started uh, working to figure out, okay, how many people are actually cheating in order to, say, gain entry into Boston? That was yeah. just kind of the first thing I thought of, uh, why somebody would cheat. And then, you know, for the first year, I think we found about 60 or more runners that, you know, actually cheated in order and used that, in, you know, those results in order to uh, run Boston legitimately. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then on that note, you know, asking you a bit of a, a hard question, and I'm not meaning it to kind of attack you in any way, but w- what gives you the right to feel that you can kind of play vigilante? And, you know, you mentioned there that, um, you know, they're only cheating themselves. So, you know, obviously it's not right, but what is the harm in, you know, these people kind of doing this? Um, yeah, I think I kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah. And I tried to, and as I've, you know, from when I first started writing a blog kind of to myself, where it started getting the attention that it has now to where I know if I write something, you know, a lot of people are going to see it. Um, so I'm a little more um, selective in what I actually write about. Um, again, I'm trying to, you know, I'm not going to person that's only hurting themselves, a person that's, you know, cheating their way to a five hour finish because they're tired and decided, you know, they didn't want to do the whole course versus the person. Again, it's the person who's, you know, claiming, mm-hmm. you know, claiming the victory, you know, they're in the medal fo- photo, they have the medal, they're posting on social media. And again, they're, they're taking away something else. They're, you know, taking a Boston qualifying spot away from somebody. Yeah. They're taking a podium finish from somebody. So, I, I, yeah, I try to definitely draw a line, like the accidental course cutter, to the person who, okay, you know, this person is somehow gaining, profiting off of this, um, you know, you know, through a qualifying time, podium finish, or maybe, you know, there's cases people have coaching businesses and are using mm. some falsified results to build up their resume. So, yeah, it has to be kind of repeated, egregious, and, again, you know, stealing something from someone else. Okay. And then, you know, just going a bit further into that, I have a question from one of my um, Patreon members, Mark Sikelsky. Um, How often, if ever, is someone able to vindicate themselves that you were incorrect and the results were actually real? Has that happened in any case? Um, nobody that I've written about. Um, there, was one, um, there was one case where there was a suspicious looking result where I messaged the race director and the result was incorrect, but it was incorrect on the time on the timer's point. Mm. And even the and the timer wasn't communicating with the race director, and, and they almost disqualified this woman, um, you know, from the race. Um, where in fact, you know, legitimately they had a timing chip issue, and so she triggered the one on the other side of the course before you know the the first chip, and so they just kind of smoothed it out. They just kind of plugged in a fake time to fill in the gap. So so I emailed them saying, hey, this. Data, this can't be right. And they kind of, you know, and it almost, you know, resulted, in, and I would have felt horrible had that happened. But, so you didn't um, actually, yeah. you, you no, know, you I didn't actually write, I didn't actually write an article, but that's the one case, you know, where I reported somebody. And yes, it was an incorrect result, but it was on the timers and the, you know, and the races um, fault. So, um, so no, I've never written and called anybody out on, you know, as cheating, you know, that had not. Um, again, there's always grayer as far as the intent. So, you know, people can, will you know, sometimes try to justify the intent and say, you know, so that's why I'm very careful that it's as much as possible to make sure I know the intent before I write something. So I'm not, you know, writing someone. And again, there's a lot of cases where people, they'll decide they want to run the half the day of the race because they're not feeling it and the race may not correct the results immediately. So mm-hmm. um, I've learned to look out for those. Uh, you know, types of cases. And then in that case, I'll just notify the race, say, hey, I think this person belongs in the half. So would you you say a lot more goes into it now than maybe initially when you first kind of started looking at this? Uh, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, As far as more being more selective as a writer write about and kind of giving, um, thinking it's a, you know, a timing issue first before, besides thinking somebody's, you know, cutting the course first. So I'm really giving more of the benefit of the doubt than maybe I would have, you know, not knowing as much as I do now. Okay. Okay. And I have another question from uh, another Patreon member, Elizabeth saying, what can the, what can the individual who has cheated do to redeem themselves? Is there anything that they can do maybe that you will update on the website or once they make a mistake and, you know, you've kind of outed them if they keep doing it, um, 
is that it? They just kind of, you know, have to deal with the, um, you know, deal with basically the punishment of what mm-hmm. they did. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's consequences, but um, yeah, there's cases, again, if you know, somebody will, you know, if they admit, you know, you know, basically, you know, admit and apologize to those that they need to apologize to. Um, I'll always, you know, you know, if somebody comes to me that I've outed and they come and say, hey, yeah, you know, I'm sorry I did this, and I'll publish any statement they want me to. Okay. It doesn't, you know, typically happen. Or again, if you know they want to fully admit, uh, one runner that I wrote about, it was I was on, um, she actually appeared on the Today Show um, story, and you know, she was in Shadow and all that. But again, she, you know, prior to all that, you know, again, she, you know, once I reached out to her before writing the article, she fully admitted everything. And you know, she's taken steps to, you know. You know, she sent back um, any awards she got and she got herself, you know, called racist and then took action to get herself removed from the results. And so I, I never, you know, since she fully admitted without, you know, needing to to me, um, you know, again, I took steps to kind of keep her, you know, her privacy and keep, you know, and kind of hear her story. So she kind of wrote, you know, helped me with the article as far as writing, you know, what drove her to cheat and, and did all that. So, yeah, so I'll definitely, again, if, you know, someone, you know, admits it and, you know, come clean and shows, you know, remorse, uh, yeah, I'll definitely you know, even on the front end, be more, you know, more sympathetic. And then, you know, get on the back end. I'll always, you know, if somebody wants to put a statement out there, I'll always help push that okay. forward. And then you mentioned, you know, uh, kind of rectifying the situation and, um, you know, her explaining maybe a little bit as to why, why she did it. But have you noticed any common themes of why people would do something, you know, like that? What, you know, obviously the Boston qualifier is a, is a pretty, um, standard one here, but is there any, what other whys do people have for, for, you know, either doing either of the types of cheating? Yeah, but um, really, it's I mean, again I'm seeing a lot just kind of on the social media, you know, wanting some affirmation, you know, the, the bragging that, and that's really again maybe I'm getting a uh, a lot of those because that's how a lot of people are getting caught because they're you know someone's posting this fabulous results on social media, their friends are like I don't think they're capable, but let me look at the result and send it on to me. So I, I think I'm getting uh, maybe a disproportionate amount of those, but the ones I'm seeing, yeah, a lot of it's just kind of the social media, you know, vindication and the attention, but you know you know, the bragging and, you know, in the past before social media, it, you know, wouldn't have been as, you know, obvious. And now it's easy to kind of follow up and check on those. So yes. I think a, def- a lot of it is just again for, you know, the bragging, you know, just for the, for the social media, you know, for the bragging. Yeah. Okay. And then, so I, uh, you know, I'm assuming photos of races come into this a lot in, in kind of helping. You mentioned earlier that it was a different picture of someone who had uh, switched a bit, but, but, how how do you know the difference between you know someone just having a big breakthrough in maybe a race that doesn't have timing mats or maybe they're quite sporadic? How do you know if it's a break big breakthrough or, or you know if their chip wasn't working compared to um, you know actually doing this intentionally? Like what are the red flags that you look for? Um, yeah, there's there's definitely cases when you see the big breakthroughs, um, and um, you know again that's just you know case like wow that you know that's a big difference, but everything, the data looks fine or there's nothing to say, okay, yeah, this person, you know, she did, so I just, you know, so I would just let it go. Um, in the case, um, with the, and sometimes with the, yeah, the smaller races, they don't have as many, you know, turning points and all that. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that, well, that time looks suspicious, but I just don't have anything. So I just, you know, so I just let it go. So I don't say, you know, how to make a conclusion or do anything one way or the other. It's just, um, it, it is what it is. Um, then as far as the difference, like, you know, yeah, there are valid, um, you know, cases where, you know, where the timing that didn't work or the timing chip did not work. Um, and, you know, in that case, uh, you know, things I can look for is, you know, the, the, you know, if it worked, you know, just missed a couple chips, I can, okay, did they gain any kind of, you know, was there any pace change in the area where they're missing the timing? Um, that's, that's kind of the key. Um, so if somebody's, you know, running a nine minute mile, um, they miss a timing chip and they're running six and a half minutes over that period. And the map shows there was an opportunity to cut. Uh, yeah. I'd be very suspicious of that. Um, again, I'm sure some people are ahead of me. I'm sure some people, you know, cut the course and make sure their pace, you know, isn't improve- improving, but they're getting a better result by only running 20 miles versus 26.2. So, I mean, I'm sure there's some I miss that way. Uh, but again, it has to be more than I'll never say someone cheated just because they missed timing math. There has to be a lot more to it. And what about, do you ever see cases of, you know, just thinking about my, some of my previous marathons, you know, I'm very good at negative splitting. So let's say the, the final 
timing mat that you might go across is at mile 20 and then someone Mm -hmm. is feeling really good and they've been kind of holding back you know making sure they get through quote unquote the wall and then they they pick it up drastically um how do you know in that situation that someone's not you know just really picked it up really feeling good yeah and then that happens it's funny you brought that across because there was one there was a small race um just this past weekend where i noticed the result with a pretty big negative split um, and better time than the runner normally had. And, but, you know, the explanation was, you know, they were, you know, pacing with, you know, they're running with a friend, the friend told them to go on. And so they were running, you know, they're running that slower pace because they're running with a friend till the last five miles. And then, you know, and then left them. So to me, that's a feasible, you know, reason in the absence of anything else. So yeah, you can tell, I'll look for the history. Um, they say, Hey, this person, you know, typically run this negative split. If somebody, um, where it's more questionable is if somebody like runs this, you know, like the full, like, like, for example, like that last, you know, say the last 10 K you have a timing, man, if somebody ran that last 10 K and has substantial race history of running 10 Ks or five Ks, and that pace was faster than what they would do a standalone five K mm-hmm. or 10 K, then I'd be a lot more suspicious. Mm-hmm. Sometimes even then there's reasons. Um, so yeah, so more than that, again, there just has to be kind of like two key things like, okay, boy, they ran a huge negative split, but, you know, and there's no photos, you know, there's photos of everybody else except for them during that period, um, or they're missing that. So yeah, so it has to be again something else before I would go to the yeah you know, go to the extreme um, or Strava data. Sometimes people post Strava data of them that shows them cut course. So oh, um, oh wow. Yeah, so yeah, so that, that's how. Yeah, what well, you said, the big negative split would be definitely be a flag, and yeah. that would you know make me look further. But it, in of itself, it typically wouldn't be you know enough evidence again unless it's somebody who's unless there's just something ridiculous and they're going to see it, you know, where it showed a four minute pace for the last half marathon or something. It's like, okay, that didn't happen. <laughs> how, how would they, cause surely then it would say the distance was off too. On this yeah. 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 You get that with seven. Sometimes you'll see them or, or they'll manually manipulate it, but you can tell um, huh. typically when that happens that with the triathlon I just wrote about last week, um, she sent me a manual entry for proof, a screenshot, you know, not the actual file. And then, and she actually, and I asked her for splits about a day later, she sent me splits where it was basically copied and pasted, in, you know, different segments from different runs she had. Um, it just made yeah, no sense. So yeah, so people go to extremes. Okay. And then, so you've decided to, you know, write about someone, maybe they've done it multiple times. Maybe it does seem intentional. Um, something all seems to line up. Do, does any part of you feel bad for kind of publicly shaming these people? And, you know, I know shaming is effective and, uh, one of my Patreon members, you know, noted that it's um, harsh, but it might make you seem like a worse person than you actually are. So does any part of you like feel bad when you're doing this? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the part I really hate most is writing the articles, but um, kind of initially when I you know, started, it's like, well, why don't you just report these people to the races and um, you know, they'll take care of it. But that wasn't taking care of it. There's mm. instances of people who cheated over the years, had disqualifications and continued. Um you know, until it was kind of, you know, made aware. So, um, yeah, so I don't think I haven't felt uh, bad for any of the articles that I've, you know, written in of themselves. Um, you know, there was the one case that went extremely viral, uh, Jane Shio, and, it, um, where again, she was the runner who I mentioned who had, you know, cheated to a second place finish in the half marathon. Um, but then the ensuing coverage, I didn't even mention her name in my article. Um, but then two and coverage just took off because he, she worked for Huffington Post. He was a Harvard grad. Um, so all that stuff is what got picked up on in the media. And again, it went, that went national viral, you know, based on my article. So I, I, I did kind of feel bad for how much, you know, attention she got, you know, for what she did relative to others who I think have done just as bad or worse. Mm-hmm. And have you had people kind of say to you things like that, that, you know, you shouldn't be doing this and it's cruel? Um, yeah, I, I get some of that. It's overwhelming. It's on the, you know, it's on the other side, but yeah, occasionally I do get, um, yeah, yeah, I do get that criticism and I, and I take it hard. And again, it's, I think as it's gotten bigger and as I realized, again, I'm much more and more sensitive with what I write or, or who I write about or what information I reveal. Um, again, if there's any kind of gray area as far as intent, you know, I won't even, you know, I won't post the final time and, you know, I won't post anything that would be, you know, able to go back to the individual if it's kind of a more generic article. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I try to be, um, yeah, much more careful and selective. There's many more times that I just, you know, I'll just report a result to the race director and be done with it. Then, you know, I probably write an article on maybe 10% of what I, you know, what I hear about, if oh, not okay. less. 
All right. And from what, you know, you've, the way you've been talking so far in this interview and the fact that I couldn't really find much about you, it doesn't seem like this is the case, but is any part of it about the kind of the attention you get, the publicity, like kind of, this is kind of cool that I've become known as the guy that's kind of saving the day, essentially. Is any part of you enjoy that or is it nothing to do with that for you? No, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's cases where there's been articles, yeah, that kind of cool, and other cases, like, I'd really rather not, you know, <laughs> rather mm-hmm. not be, and so, uh, when I started, I, I started anonymously, um, again, just kind of worried about, you know, what some of the kickback was, and then, um, Runners World did an article leading up to the Boston, and what I was doing for the Boston Marathon at that point, when I kind of became public with the, with the blog, but, yeah, I mean, there are a number, there's, if you look, I mean, there's a number of articles. There's probably, you know, it's like 50, 60 articles that you would, you know, you'd find if you hunt it down. So it's, you know, so it's definitely out there. Um, I think people more kind of know of the website and the work I do than if you just said my name, they might not, yeah. you know, they may not connect it at that point. Uh-huh. Um, you know, but there are a number like on my Facebook group, Facebook page, you know, there's over, I want to say it's like 14,000 people following and, you know, it's, yeah, and I post it there under my name all the time. So, um, yeah, so it's definitely out there, but yeah, the notoriety or however you call it, it's kind of, you know, again, there's good points and bad points. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, thank you for explaining that. Uh, yeah. All right. So one more thing just before we kind of uh, move on a little bit is, do you, does any part of you feel that we're focusing on the negativity in our sport? Like, is any part of it kind of, you know, you're bringing negativity into the world. We should be just focusing on the positive, you know, negativity is just bringing bad energy into our lives. Like, do you disagree with that, that it is better to kind of get, um, I don't know, get people to take, uh, responsibility for their actions, despite it kind of making you seem very negative. Um, yeah, I'll kind of answer that in two parts. Yeah, I, I definitely disagree with that statement. Again, while I'm, writing primarily on the negative is so that the people that are in the positive can enjoy that. Um, I actually, mm-hmm. I actually talked to the person who was like the last person to get into Boston, you know, it was right at the cutoff and you know, she was interviewed as part of that ESPN story, mm-hmm. whatnot again. And the thinking was, Hey, without my work, you know, if I didn't get these people removed from Boston before they could enter and she would not have gotten in. So really it's, yes, I'm, folk, I'm writing about the negative side of it, but again, it's so the people who, put the work in, um, you know, can, can, you know, can get the proper rewards and, uh, kind of the second part to that answer. Yeah. It, it's always writing about the negative is kind of tough. So I've actually started, um, two weeks ago was the first one trying to, you know, ask people for their positive stories that I could, you know, could share on my, on my website. Okay. Um, so I just wrote, so I wrote a story, story the other week about a charity that trains, people from the homeless shelter to run half marathons and it gives kind of gives them confidence and achievement and whatnot. So I wrote about that. So I'll be writing more kind of more stories on that end. I like kind of a bigger audience. I get a little more leeway to do, you know, to do some of that. Um, and I never in positive stories too. I actually wrote, there was a runner who w- was disqualified from London where I used my same techniques in order to get him reinstated. Um, so yeah, so I'm always happy to write about the, yeah, the positive as well. That's good. Okay. So people can know if something does, maybe if they get disqualified and they know they did the right thing, you are the person they could maybe go to to oh, yeah. help them, <laughs> help them get their rightful place and, and their name back in the results. Cause... Yeah. I mean, that was my, that was London marathon. That was probably the most mm-hmm. um, rewarding story I wrote. And I probably wrote about five different stories during the whole process trying to, Hey, you know, I have the evidence. I mean, I literally went to Google street view to show where he was on the course at a specific time, mm-hmm. knowing that it wasn't possible that, you know, the, hey, the timing data was right. It was wrong. And so, yeah, so I went through, that's probably the most work I put on any story was, you know, get, was getting that run vindicated. Yeah. Okay, great. And you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, there was one runner that you nearly kind of outed, but in the end managed to figure it out how, how she was able to do it. But, uh, have, has what you do ever backfired? You know, you talked to me in email about, um, kind of feeling slightly bad about, um, a previous guest of this podcast, Amelia Gappin. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, you did an article about Stevie, Erin and Amelia. Uh, will you tell us, you know, how that unfolded? What happened there? Um, just for anyone who kind of was, uh, did see what, you know, the media storm that went down with that and obviously heard Amelia's side of the story earlier. So I'd love for you to explain to us what you, what you thought with that. Yeah, sure. Um, and again, that's the story I wrote was about, uh, Stevie Romer and I became aware of Stevie cause somebody wouldn't say reported Stevie, but someone just kind of made me aware that, and Stevie was, um, is that 
trans female um, who has yet to go through didn't go through the reassignment surgery, has had no hormone treatment, but um, was registered to run and qualified to run Boston as a female. Yep. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, reached out to Boston, and they were aware, and the other, and they were again fine with it, but they hadn't put out an official policy that said, you know, yes, we, you know, we, you know, we fully accept Stevie and her time as a female, you know, even though the previous policy was, um, they required, they actually required that a runner get the surgery in order to qualify for Boston as that, under that gender. So I, I thought that was a very interesting story. Um, again, most of my readers uh, probably disagreed with my opinion, but I thought Boston made the right call there. Um, so I reached out to Stevie um, just to kind of get her side um, to get her story. And she was, you know, very cooperative and very excited to, you know, participate and, you know, to kind of be out there. And as I was researching, um, I didn't know, Hey, it's, you know, Stevie going to be the first runner to be openly accepted in the Boston marathon under the female standard. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was kind of the difference in the past, um, where runners would, um, again, they weren't, trying to make sure I uh, word this correctly, but again, they were, there were definitely other trans female runners that had run Boston, but they weren't, you know, according to the policy, they weren't openly accepted as, you know, as the female runners under the female times. So in doing my research, that led me to Amelia um, and to Aaron. Um, and so I didn't want to just write Stevie's story and say, hey, Stevie's going to be the first, knowing that there were um, at least two other um, transgender uh, women that were running. And so I interviewed Amelia through, um, you know, Facebook and she gave me some, you know, some good information as far as, as again, she actually went through the uh, gender reassignment surgery and that was the policy of the BAA at the time was that you had to have the surgery in order to use a qualifying time as a female. Um, and so uh, after, you know, again, reaching out to her, you know, I wrote, wrote the article, um, Aaron, I wasn't able to get a hold of, um, but um, part of the story, again, I wasn't, and I think p what part of what Amelia um, didn't like about the article was that, she felt that I was saying that they were the first ones when really, you know, her thing was, Hey, this has been going on for years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to clarify that again. My, my point was, Hey, they were the first ones to be openly admitted under BAA's new policy. Um, and part of the article, I wanted the BAA to publicly state what their policy was. So, you know, everyone would be aware. Um, cause I knew it, that I would be getting, you know, after Boston marathon, if people saw TV, you know, running the course, I'd probably, get messages on it from people. Hey, did this person qualify legitimately? So I wanted to kind of put the policy, you know, put the policy out there and say, Hey, they're, they're welcome there. And, and I agree with the policy. Um, so, um, and then with Erin, um, her, and she had stated in a prior article that her goal was to be the first transgender woman to qualify for the Boston marathon. So that's kind of where it came from where I said, Hey, these, you know, these three women are the first transgender female to qualify for the Boston marathon, you know, under the female standard. So I think it was a little bit of confusion so I, that I tried to clarify in the article. And then, um, as you probably knew from, you know, talking to Amelia and, you know, I knew from conversations that you have to be very careful on, you know, on the verbiage and the terms on what's, to be deemed offensive and all that. And I did my best mm -hmm. in the article to cover all that. And apparently I didn't do good enough. Um, so Amelia did email me with, you know, some corrections, both, you know, asking for clarification on, you know, on the, the being the first runners and then with some terminology. And so with everything that was going on with me, moderating my message boards and stuff, I didn't fully update the article with, you know, with her comments. So I definitely apologize for if there's anywhere where I was being insensitive there. Um, it definitely wasn't my intent. Um, and then again, this, the second thing she, um, she was concerned about making this public worried about possibly being targets. Um, and again, I definitely, that, you know, that wasn't my intent. And that was really the first I've heard of, mm -hmm. you know, concern for their safety. Um, again, that's, and I can't tell Amelia how she you know, should feel. So I feel bad that she felt, um, uh, that way. I do just know that, um, you know, Stevie was thrilled with the publicity and everything that went on and, and again, Stevie was the main focus of the article. So I was kind of pleased with that. And then other feedback was generally positive, uh, from, um, other, um, trans athletes. So again, I'm, so I'm hoping it came across, um, you know, as I intended generally, um, but yeah, I definitely apologize. And I you know, feel bad yeah. if anybody felt that they were, you know, threatened. Definitely wasn't my intent. And I'm glad you asked that at the end of your interview that, you know, if she thought my intentions were good, and I was glad that she, she acknowledged that she didn't think I had any bad intention to writing the article, yeah. even though it was, a, it was a little bit off, you know, off the scope of what I normally do. Um, but again, I, and I probably, you know, 
more of my core readers were probably, you know, differed from me. So I probably upset them more than I did, you know, those, you know, in the, you know, within the trans community. Cause again, there's people think, you know, especially with Stevie. And then that, I think that was interesting. Cause again, there was no hormones, no, you know, it was just Stevie saying, Hey, I identify as a female. I'm registering mm-hmm. qualifying as a female. Mm-hmm. I thought that was much more interesting and kind of more the point of my article, um, you know, that Boston, ex- you know, accepted her, you know, willingly. And that, and that did lead to, again, a lot of national media coverage, um, you know, towards that policy. And I think overall it was positive. I think I got more people thanking me for that than people yeah. who were, you know, critical, but, uh, but I, I appreciate and understand Amelia's concerns. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's, it's pretty clear by now that you, you know, that wasn't malicious. You obviously can tell by the way you were just saying that, that, you know, you did have good intentions. And as we mentioned, Amelia uh, recognizes that too. What would you change now if you could go back? You know, would you, would you write about the other two women? Would you just focus on Stevie? You know, what, what, what mistakes would you say you made that you would rectify if you could go back? Um, again, just being maybe more, um, maybe I would have waited till I probably could have waited till after the race, mm-hmm. um, which probably alleviated any of the, you know, kind of concerns for, you know, any re- repercussions about, you know, I think maybe selfishly I was looking before the race because um, kind of going off target here, but there was a runner the first year when it was known that I was looking at the results. Um, I think I had half a dozen emails on this runner who had gained weight and people said, Hey, he shouldn't be running with that. There's no way he qualified, you know, with, uh, you know, with the bib in the one thousands. And I looked and everything. No, it was the same guy. He just didn't look as fit as some, you know, you would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I'm, so my thinking was, okay, I'm going to have people, you know, you know, either approaching, you know, I, I was kind of thinking the opposite way that people are going to, you know, you know, see, um, Stevie and, um, think that, Hey, there's no way, you know, she didn't belong. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I, I think that was kind of my intent was to try to kind of quell that and say, Hey, you know, you know, if she needs, you know, that Stevie or anybody else there, that they're, you know, they're most likely legitimate. And so, um, yeah, again, I think I probably could have waited till after Boston, which mm-hmm. would have at least alleviated the concern, you know, for the safety, um, aspect. Um, and then just been, you know, again, may have been careful, maybe run the final article by Amelia or Stevie and, you know, to, you know make sure if I, you know, stumbled on any of my terminology, that yeah. would have been corrected. Okay. All right. Thank you for explaining that and, and clearing that yep. up. Um, all right. One more thing I wanted to ask about, um, thanks to Sally Pontarelli who wanted to know this, um, Let's talk about the mass cheating in Mexico. You know, how did that even happen? And for those who don't know, what did happen? Um, yeah, and it's, this first came um, to my attention last year, and I'm guessing it was probably happened in prior years too. Um, Mexico City Marathon, they've they offered a, again, it's a very, it's, I want to say it's a very inexpensive marathon. Like, I don't know the exact dollars, but it'd be like $30 or $40, you know, U.S., um, to run. And, um, uh, but the key is they offered a series, like a medal series. So every year, if you, the first year, six years ago, they offered an M for Mexico and then it was the E, the X, the I, the C, the O. Um, and so it's, you know, as time went on, years went on, they became very coveted. Um, so what happened last year, uh, I was starting to get emails on people saying, boy, there's, you know, there's thousands of cheaters in Mexico city marathon. I'm like, I just thought that can't be right. Uh, so, you know, but then I, I pulled the data, looked at it and sure enough, you know, it looked like there were, you know, I just remember there were over 5,000 people that cheated at last year's Mexico city marathon. Out of how many? Um, um, oh gosh, I should know the total. <laughs> I don't have it total, but yeah, it's, you know, out of maybe, um, I don't know if it's like 30,000 or okay, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I could, I could, I could be off by 10,000 or so. I, I don't have a number right in front of me, but it was a significant percentage in what was happening. You know, this, I had photos and videos of runners just standing along the course and they would just enter, you know, maybe 5k left, 10k left or at the half or wherever. Um, but they weren't even crossing the start line for the most part. They were just entering later in the race to, you know, run part of it and collect their medal. Um, and so, yeah, it was just getting upwards of over, you know, it was over 5,000 last year. And then they were going to take steps to stop that from happening this year. Um, they were going to, you know, mail medals for everyone who confirmed finishing, but they, they didn't do that. They'd, you know, it was exactly the same last year. It was over 5,000, again, runners who, you know, who cut the course or just ran partial course to collect their last medal. Um, so, yeah, it's a crazy. And, and part of the issue, again, there's a lot of, uh, well, who cares? You know, they paid for the race, let them get their medal. Um, it, but, again, you had runners, you know, I mean, I had, there were runners who ran the half marathon in 20 minutes. You know, they just hopped yeah. on. And so they're hopping ahead of the little leaps. And they're, you know, and they're impeding those who are truly legitimately racing the course. Um, so yeah, so it's amazing. So I'm hope, hoping, I know it's, you can't control all 26 miles of the course, but you can take steps to kind of, 
um, you know, get, you know, cut down on the motivation to do that either, you know, checking at the, you know, at the finish line for, you know, splits and then it was time consuming and whatnot. So yeah, so it's very hard, but I mean, runners just hopping on the course all throughout just, you know, kind of caused havoc to those who really yeah. wanted to compete. And do the race directors seem to be taking it seriously in that way? Um, again, I thought they were after last year. Um, uh, but again, I mean, they were offering where you could, people could buy repl- replica medals, you know, to try to stop this from happening, but it didn't seem to have any effect. Um, <laughs> So, I guess yeah, watch yeah. The so hopefully they just go back to their hopefully they just go back to their standard, um, yeah, medals next year, and we'll see if it, it cuts down at all. Yeah, it will be interesting to see, and uh, if not, then we'll have to look at your numbers to see if it's if it's decreased. Or not. <laughs> yeah, and even then, they kind of did the bad math. They're they're, they're admitting to three thousand, but I had two sets of results where it was definitely over five thousand that were disqualified. <laughs> so they're admitting that. I think the initial reports was 13,000. It wasn't that bad, but it was more than the 3,000. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you for explaining that. I, di- I didn't know about that until um, I actually looked it up, you know, doing this interview. I had no idea that had happened, but just absolutely staggering the number of people that would do that. But, um, okay, so let's look at, look into the future. What can we do to stop, you know, this, this happening, both types of cheating? You know, you, obviously this is your goal with... Um, with what you do, but, um, you know, what do you hope will happen? Is it the fear that people will be shamed that they don't want to do it? Um, will it ever stop? What are your thoughts around the future? Uh, yeah. And, and I think it's kind of cut back a little bit. Um, cause I'm finding, or I'm just, you know, catching more up front, but I find that as I go through Boston's results and I'm not getting just the, all the obvious serial cheaters. I think I've weeded a lot of those out. So I'm not seeing, the obvious cheaters, you know, at the top of my list, you know, for Boston. So again, I think that's helping and I think people are being more vigilant. Um, and I think, you know, again, the race directors, you know, to what they can do, I, you know, I, I think they're uh, being more receptive and doing a better job of removing, you know, okay. removing the runners from the results that don't belong there. So yeah, so I think all of the above, um, you yeah, I think there's definitely a deterrent effect, um, you know, which is kind of the goal, like, Hey, I, you know, Hey, I don't want to be, you know, yeah, I don't want to be, you know, reported on or, you know, I don't want to be, you know, be on the website. So, yeah, so there's, there's definitely, there's definitely that. And again, I think just to kind of bring it to light that it is a problem and, you know, you know, people reporting more just the race directors don't have to report it to me, but if they see something, you know, they realize it's not necessarily victimless to go ahead and report it to the race. Okay. Or, so yeah, you're saying to me. people should, you know, if you see something, you should say something to your race director, if something looks a little off or if you notice someone who suddenly appears. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We report to the race and, you know, then, hey, if the race isn't taking action, you think they should, then, you know, then shoot me an email. But, yeah, it doesn't all need to, you know, I don't own the, I don't have a monopoly on it. Definitely the race director should be the first person to, should be the first person you contact. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Okay, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the Running for Real 4. Are you enjoying these cool mornings? How about the intense workouts that are just as hard as they always were? I don't know about you, but I always feel like workouts are going to be somehow easy in the fall after a hot summer, but they're still, well, hard. I still feel beaten up after hard days and after long runs, and I still get sore the next day, but a less sore when I have Body Health Perfect Amino to speed up the recovery process. I take a lot of comfort knowing that it is working hard to repair my muscles as soon as I stop running or strength training. Then I can eat my meal, my usual 25 minutes later to fuel up again. I wish I could say I used that time to stretch, foam roll, do mobility and rehab, but let's be realistic, that doesn't always happen. Usually I'm jumping in the shower and trying to get clothes on before Bailey starts crying or I have to do something else on my list. At least I know Body Health Perfect Amino has my back right from the stop of my watch. If you don't believe me, you can try Body Health Perfect Amino with 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it or you can't see a difference, you can get your money back. Use coupon code TINA10 for 10% off everything at bodyhealth.com. And if you aren't a fan of the tablets, they also have Perfect Amino XP powder and there's a new mixed berry flavor to try. Remember, code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. Earlier in the show, I introduced you to our new sponsor, Bombus. You may remember I did a giveaway with Bombus for my birthday week, and I've been raving about them on social media. Why? Because I just love them. Two years of research and development led to multiple improvements of the sock design, performance, and comfort, including arch support system that gives you extra support where you need it, 
stay in place technology while not being too loose and they never leave a mark and the seamless toe means that there's no more of that annoying bump on your toes but you want to know the best part one pair sold is one pair donated did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters but you actually can't donate used socks that's why Bombas donates one brand new pair of socks for every pair they sell to date they've sold and donated over nine million pairs Bombas were created for runners, walkers, power loungers, snowboarders, Netflixers, and to me, they feel like you are getting one of those lovely tight squeeze hugs, the ones that just really mean a lot, which I love to give. Some people hate them, but I love them. And here's the bit you want to know. Running for your listeners, get 20% off your first order by going to bombas.com forward slash running for real. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com forward slash running for real and you'll get 20% off your first order with code running for real with the number four. All right, Derek, just four more questions for you. Uh, This one is going to be interesting. My first question is to tell us about, you know, I don't know if you even have social media. I couldn't really find much on you, but tell us about um, if you have a situation, maybe you don't, where there's a photo that doesn't quite show what it seems. Now, this is particularly interesting with you, but maybe um, <laughs> I don't I don't know whether that is something that would be relevant, but, um, you know, I'd love to hear if there's something that you did in your life that isn't quite maybe correct as what it would seem. Um, I think I think I know what your next question is. I might apply to that more, but uh, no, um, really, I have very little of my running photos online. It's going to be when I was really running. Um, yeah, so nothing along those lines. You know, that was you know, ten years ago, mostly until until just now. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's probably some pictures of there where I probably look. Uh, you know, when you see the camera, you try to look like you're not not completely dying. So, uh-huh. You know, you may have to, you know, tried to put on a better better pose and how you were feeling you know, during the race and stuff. And as far as everyday life, yeah, pretty, anything with the kids. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a, a a seven and nine year old. So yeah, anything where they're looking all happy and calm. I'm sure there was mass chaos moments before and after the yeah. photo, but uh, yeah. that that's yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. But. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned about um, the photo, the running photo, because I feel like that's what most people do. But I keep finding myself when when I'm, you know, this is since I've stopped professional running, but uh, when I see a photo I always used to kind of look serious and be like focused and determined and you know yes I would try and make sure my running form looked as best as I could (laughs) but I I didn't ever smile at the camera and now I keep doing that when I see a camera and afterwards I'm like why did you just do that you should have just smiled at the camera like you're stupid like stop doing this serious face you're not doing it so I need to get myself more into the kind of having fun and waving photos which I see a lot of other people yeah. and they look really cool they're good photos I seem to recall I kind of like had a minor injury like trying to jump for a photo or something so now I just try to <laughs> okay. and then the funny thing is I did the you know flying pig about a month ago and it's like I'm like I'm in maybe no I'm in no course photos I went so it took me so long my GPS died. So I'm like everything that I would accuse somebody for cheating if they had a fast time was me. I'm like, okay, Derrickson, why he's in photos at the finish, he doesn't have GPS evidence, <laughs> but no one's questioning my six and a half hour time. So, so I, I guess I'm good. <laughs> that is really funny. Okay, what about a running for real moment for you? Uh, something that only runners will understand. Um, yeah, the the last. Well, before this year, it was the last marathon I did. I had just done a 24-hour race, um, wow. you know, about a month before. So I said, oh, I did that. I did 60-some miles. I can do I can do a marathon. And it was a Columbus marathon, the half and the full on the same exact course. Um, and I, it, when I was crossing um, and the full crosses, you can see the maybe a couple hundred yards down a hill, you can see the finish line for the half. So at that point, I was just dead. So, yeah, so I cut I cut the course and I finished the half marathon. Um <laughs> And, and I checked it, you know, I, I asked about the medal that I did get a half marathon medal and not the full. Um, and it was, so it's funny. So I remember checking the results and okay, I was, I was in the half marathon results. So everything was fine. Um, but when I started the website up, um, when I was become public, I'm like, you know, I better check those results one more time to make sure that I don't have a two or I don't have a two hour, 20 minute full marathon sitting on my, on my resume to make, to make sure. So, yeah. So yeah, I, that would have been um, really funny for people to be like, yeah, Hey, so, wait, this guy is doing it himself. He's doing it. So, too. Yeah. So that was the only time. That's the only time I, I still kind of consider that a DNF. Uh, you know, I, I, I meant to run the full and I didn't, you know, have this course not been identical for the you know up to that point i would have you know i wouldn't have had a finish time so yes i, I consider that a dns even though i'm in the i am in the half result that's funny 
Well, maybe you should be emailing the race director just to be safe, especially now you've out <laughs> Yeah, I check them like, I better check on that before <laughs> my name gets out there. Yeah. Okay. And what about a high moment for you in your running? Um, probably the, um, I mean, like a couple of really, you know, finishing the first marathon, you know, when I was like, went from a non-runner to running a, mar- you know, running a marathon and, you know, in about four months. So that was it. But, uh, beyond that, the first time I, I did, um, 24, North Coast 24, I did a 24 hour race and yeah, I had no idea what I'd be able to do. And I was, you know, thrilled. I'd, I don't have, I know my exact mileage. I should, but it was, you know, I did over, you know, six, you know, I think it was about 64, 65 miles the first time. Um, and I, that's a only time besides the first marathon where I like just broke down at the end, like, mm. okay, hey, this is done. I can't believe I did, you know, you know, yeah, two plus, equivalent like two plus marathons in 24 <laughs> hours. And, and I was completely untrained for it too. So I may have been crying in pain, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <I'm laughs> but, sure. but I was amazed. I'm like, well, what can I do if I really, you know, put myself, you know, put my mind to it? So yeah. was, uh, that was definitely kind of a highlight. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you stand on the start line? Um, well, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> It's been so. I'm starting after doing it so long, and again, I'm nervous every time starting there. It's like, okay, can I can I finish this? You know, you know, why? Yeah. Then 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 I want to sell into it. Then it's just like, hey, just have fun. Okay. Um, so I'm, yeah, get all competing for myself. So I'm not racing against yeah. anybody at this point. Okay. And so obviously, people can find you at marathoninvestigation.com. But where where else can people find you, or is there anywhere else? Would you rather just people go straight there if they want to, you know, learn about what you do, learn more about um, the positive stuff that you're starting to include? Tell us about um, where we can find you if people are interested. Yeah, um, def- definitely on the. I would say the face- Facebook. Um, I have, there's a there's a company page and the group page, and so that's where I share all the articles. And there's always much better discussion there than on the message board on the site. So just look up a uh, marathon investigation, search on Facebook and you'll see there's both the group page. Um, and then just, just my company page. Um, and again, I'd share articles there and I'll share within the group. I'll share again, other positive articles or any other articles written you know, by other sources. And, and there's a lot of good discussion that goes on there. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for sharing the, uh, the story behind the, the marathon investigation website. This has been really interesting to hear, you know, how your mind works and, and learn more about it, especially, um, as hopefully we will get a better sport coming out the other side, if we are able to kind of, uh, put people off doing this in the future. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, I look forward to, you know, reading more in the future about, uh, some of the people that have helped, uh, from, you know, the, the decrease in cheating. And, uh, I think, you know, you have a good thing going here. So looking forward to seeing more of it. All right. Thank you very much. Well, what did you think? A little bit different of an episode, but I thought it'd be interesting to get into Derek's mind and see what his intentions or goals were of the site. What do you think? Will we ever see cheating stop? And do websites like this actually help? I really would love to hear your thoughts and maybe we could share it in the Running For Real Superstars community and uh, see what everyone else thinks. I really am interested to know what your thoughts are. Now, if you're not sure what the heck I'm talking about when I say superstars, the Running For Real Superstars community is my free community on Facebook. All you need to do is answer a few questions to prove you're not spam and you'll be let in. I promise it is the one, one of the most positive, wonderful, supportive places you've ever been and you'll be welcomed with open arms. Unless, actually on that note, you have to be a hugger to be in the group. Not really, but I am a big hugger, so hopefully you are a hugger. But anyway, you'll be welcomed in immediately and once you give us your favorite flavor of ice cream, we'll be happy to kind of support you and get to know you more. You're also welcome to just lurk and read the post without contributing, although I will try to lure you out to answer a question or talk to me from time to time. But in the meantime, just come check it out at tinamuir.com forward slash superstars. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 82. And you will notice that I had a few questions today from my Patreon members. If you'd like to show your appreciation for all the free stuff I provide, you can give a few dollars, pounds, euros, whatever your currency per month. And I'm so thankful. And you will get to ask your question to my future guests as well, as well as knowing up to six weeks in advance who will be coming. You can find links in the show notes or visit patreon.com forward slash running for real with the number four. Until then, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. 
Be sure to check out TinaMuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.